what is Behold Sunday, well, it's, it's something more than just look Sunday. When you, in fact, if, you're, if you've been with us in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew, it's one of Matthew's favorite words is behold. Behold, Jesus said this. Behold, Jesus did that. Behold, they went here. And it's a very unique word, and it just simply means check this out, stop, pause, pump the brakes, slow down, and look. I mean, really look. And what we've been doing the last three or four years is the first Sunday of each month, we call it Behold Sunday, where we, we take a, a sabbatical from the regular sermon series and focus in on communion, baptism, and what we're going to be doing now for the next couple of years, Lord willing, is look at the catechism, and we'll talk about that in a, in a moment. But right now, I want to start with uh, this, this question, and it's a question that I think is very, very important uh, to, to consider, okay? And the question is this, what is your world view? Now, some of you might be saying, I don't have a worldview. Oh, no. <laughs> Everybody has a world. If worldviews are like belly buttons. Everybody has one, but nobody wants to talk about it. And that's what a worldview is. A worldview is simply the glasses that you wear to see the world politically, socially, morally, spiritually. It's how you see things. Now, some worldview questions are like this, and there's different ways to do this, uh, but here's some worldview questions that every one of us in this room has a response to. Origin, where do we come from? Identity, what does it mean to be human? Meaning, why are we here? Condition, what's wrong? How do we fix it? Even non-Christians know that there's something wrong, and so how do we fix it? Destiny, what happens when we die? Those kinds of questions shape what we think about the world. And we look through that lens and we see that. And one of the reasons why we're going to be covering the catechism for the next couple of years during Behold Sunday is simply because this catechism that was written by Beth uh, Whitney and Cole Harper, it responds, it disciples us in a worldview. And parents, I, I, we talk to you guys all the time. You know as well as I that the world is varsity when it comes to discipling your children on a worldview. And that worldview is contrary to the word of God. It just is. And they are being discipled in this culture to see the world a specific way. And what Beth and Cole have done is they've taken some things, some truths of scripture, and they've brought them into the 21st century on how we can be able to, not just for our children, but for us as well, develop a worldview. I'm just letting you know right now, I'm working through this as well. I want to memorize it. I want, to, I want this to be a part of me. And the reason why we're doing this on Behold Sunday is because those of you who have been around church long enough, you know this that it's, churches are really great at starting things, and then they fizzle, right? The, this, this should not fizzle. I look at this document here that was, that was written by our two servants, great theologians in their own right. This document, I look at as a 50-year document that perhaps young people, your grandchildren may appreciate someday. That's how serious this is. And so each morning or each uh, Behold Sunday, we're just going to look at this and just see what, what, what we have, all right? Now, also on this, and I didn't know that Beth and her team was doing this. So Beth, if you want to come on up here, you know, I, I didn't know that you guys were doing this. A, a good lead pastor would know what's going on, and maybe someday we'll get one. But I did. <laughs> How am I supposed to respond to that? Well, if you like your job, you won't. Okay. So anyway. anyway. <laughs> this is not going the way I thought this it was going to go. Nope, right. no. nope, nope. But just share with us what you did, what you and your team did for the children. And I, I look at those, and those aren't just for kids. No, these are almost like you know, back of your pocket cheat sheets to have. Yeah. But yeah. Um, what we did is with the help of Megan Marcroft, our communications queen, I don't know yeah. what else to call yeah, her. Absolutely. And then also Allie Northcutt, who wrote the clapping song that's a part of this. A what? The clap, the clapping song. Do you remember Megan oh, and I showed right. you? Yeah. yeah okay. Okay. Right. So if you've ever done jump rope and you know, there's a little song that goes with it or Girls, I don't know if boys do this, but, you know, you do the hand clapping little rhythmic, 
Yeah, you know what? I, all these women are nodding their heads at me. And maybe, guys, you do karate with, like, I don't know. Yeah, that's it. Shoot yeah, Nerf yeah. guns. I do, I do with, a lot of karate. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so what Allie did is she took, she took the three basic questions, which are who is God, who am I, and who are we? And she created a little easy way to remember it. For instance, who is God? God is Father. God is Son. God is Spirit. Three in one. So you can do that as a family in a way that, that fits with your family culture, whether it's you're outside jumping rope and you just do it in a rhythmic way. Um, but also, there's a full set of every single catechism question with the kids' answers on the back. So, Great tool. And they're, they're a good size. They're like a deck of card size, so you could play a card game with them. You could play like a memory game. You know what? They'll even fit in your cell phone holder in your car. So we know the car is like, you've got your kids, right? They can't do anything else. Take away the iPad. Yeah. Don't let them have, you know, their book. We're going we're gonna to work on this on the way to and from school or the way to and from baseball practice or, you know, however, have them, sit them on your kitchen table and, and every meal that you are able to have together as a family, go through a question and answer and let that lead to conversations about God and doctrine and theology. I love this. And this is such a great tool. And those are available, one per household? One per household with children. With if children. you don't have children in your home, we don't. We didn't print an abundance of them. What about so, grandparents? Because you know I'm a grandfather. I don't know if you knew that or not. When you are, your grandkids are so cute. They are. And they're so yeah. smart. Yeah. And they're so athletic. And they don't get one, do they? Do I get to keep my job? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, seriously. If we really would like to make sure we resource our arcade families okay. that makes at sense. this point in time, yeah. if we end up with extra or we do come across a time that we do need to reprint, we'll let grandparents in on the fun. Yes. Right, Beth, thank, thank you. you. I love this. This is so great. And, uh, and right now, just because we want to get in the regimen of this, uh, Cole is going to read for us um, the question, but why it matters, and then some scripture. Okay, go ahead, Cole. All right, Arcade Church. How has God fashioned the world? God created everything as good, but sin seeks to decreate what God has made good. So the world's present state depicts the serpent's chaos more than our creator's kindness. Hear now the word of God from Job and Romans. Job 38, four through seven. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Who, has, who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Romans 8, verses 20 through 21. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Thanks, Cole. Appreciate it. Lord God, um, we're asking hefty questions, questions that can intimidate us, questions that can separate us from time to time. And so we want to get it right. We want to honor you. We want to love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the giftedness that you've given our brother and sister to, to write and for Madison to paint for Megan to create. Father, we thank you for that. So we ask that you be honored and you be glorified in whatever we cover now. In your son's holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, the two questions, the question that Pastor Cole dealt with last Sunday is, who is God? And the question for us, the bigger question is, who am I? But the question underneath that is, how has God fashioned the world? How has he fashioned the world? And as you look at the catechism, I want you to notice that Madison Near has painted three portraits. In fact, they're out in the lobby down over here. We've put them on the walls where you can be able to enjoy them, and there's a light on them. You've got to get a closer look. But I'm going to show this one now, and hopefully it'll come up on the wall as well, and you'll be able to look at this. What I'd like you to do is I'd, I'd like you to discuss with the people around you 
this question, what do you see? Now, there are people here who may not be able to see this, and so do them a service and describe it, but just, just look around, talk. Those of you in the balcony, you can talk to each other. What do you see? And it will take about a minute, and I'll bring us back in about a minute, okay? You at home, you can do the same thing. You can just ask, hey, what do we see in this painting as it's on the wall there, okay? Go ahead and discuss. I hope you had some good conversation. If you made a new friend, that's great too. Make sure you get their name, their address, their contact information, all that kind of stuff too, okay? All right, what do you see? Just, just shout it out. I mean, you'll have to shout it loud enough, but balcony, you can join in too. And those of you at home, you can shout out. We won't hear you, but you can shout it anyway. And so go ahead. What do you see? Banquet, okay, banquet. What else? One place setting, okay. One place setting. What else? Abundance, all right. Abundance here, beautiful. What else? I heard no chairs. What kind of a banquet has no chairs? What else? Empty glass, okay. I heard food. Burnt food, okay. You came to a barbecue at the Hardingers, obviously, so that's right, yeah. No, because I'm the barbecuer, not you, Debbie. That's what I meant to say, so. Anything else? Eating at God's table, is that what, you, what I heard? Okay, all right. Endless table. Okay. All right. Stop. Man. Our next fundraiser, we're having an auction. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's great, right? A lot of times, it's what you don't see, is you don't see chairs. You see one place setting. And who's at the head of the table? We. Me. We are. It's a point of view, and we're, we are at the head of the table. All right? We are at the head of the table. This is, this is why we need to have worldview conversations, because the worldview is this. I sit at my table. I sit at the banquet. It's a place setting for one. And that's what sin does, is it isolates us. It keeps us from each other. And notice, notice the banquet, how Madison did this. I don't even, Madison, are you here today? There you are. Stand up really quick. Just stand up. We, yeah. That was a good Miss America wave right there. I like that. That was good. Yeah. But notice that the banquet, the, the, real, the real food, the great food, the wonderful food is out of reach. It's out of reach. That's the world in which we live, and that's why we want to talk about these things. I just love this painting. You get a closer look in the hallway. It's absolutely beautiful. Well, uh, Cole read to us Ma uh, Romans chapter 8, and so go ahead and get your Bibles out and turn there to Romans chapter 8, and the passage that we're going to look at this morning is expanded from what Cole read, but it's so precious to us. So first of all, I want just to get a kind of a precursor to what's going on in Romans because it's important to get the context. Romans is kind of the Mount Everest of, of, of Christian theology about salvation. It's so vital and important. In Romans chapter, verse, or chapters 1 through 4, we've got we are saved from the penalty of sin, and Paul is just becoming this prosecutorial lawyer, and he's building a case on why each one of us is guilty of sin. And then he concludes that section in chapter 3 saying, oh, but wait, we are all guilty of sin, but God has given us a gift in Jesus Christ. And so we have been saved from the penalty of sin. Jesus Christ paid the fine that we owe God in rebellion against him. He paid it with his own life and his own blood. In addition to that, beginning at chapter 5 through chapter 7, the, the first half of it, we are saved from the power of sin. Sin no longer is our master. We are no longer slaves to sin because Jesus Christ, by his resurrection, has set us free from the power and the authority of sin. But now we have a new reality, and that's beginning at chapter 8. And actually, this could go all the way to the end of the book, to chapter 16. We are saved, we are being saved from the presence of sin. That's the rub. That is the rub 
is that yes, Jesus saved us from the penalty of sin and the power of sin, and so why am I still struggling with sin? In fact, for many of us, we never really struggled with sin until we became Christians. And you're kind of thinking, wait a minute, I thought, I thought the preacher or the Sunday school teacher or the youth worker said that when I believe in Jesus, all my problems will go away. Well, it seems that when I believed in Jesus, all my problems were created. And the problem there is because of creation. I loved what Cole read in Job 38 when God is somewhat sarcastically quizzing Job. Where were you when I did this? Where were you? And Job's response is, I wasn't around. You're God, I'm not. I put my hand over my mouth. But he noticed what, what Cole read at the very end of that passage in Job 38. When I created the heavens, what did the angels do? They shouted for joy. Because it was perfect. It's not perfect. It's not perfect in my home. It's not perfect on my street. It's not perfect in my community. It's not perfect in our country. It's not perfect in the world. It's far from it. In fact, the Bible, you may have noticed in the passage that Cole read, the Bible says it's a groan. The creation groans. Now, that's not typically a word that we use unless we hear a dad joke. And we groan, or we watch a two-hour movie, and it was the worst movie ever, and we said, groan, I'll never get that. Or if you're my age, you groan when you get out of a chair. <laughs> or you groan when your team lost in the last second or the bottom of the ninth. That's the groaning. But when the Bible talks about groaning, it talks about this, an outward expression of anguish due to pain. And what's interesting in this passage that we're looking at this morning in Romans chapter 8, there are three groans, three characters in this passage that Paul says are groaning because this world is not what it was meant to be. We were meant to flourish. Creation was meant to live harmoniously with us, and we were meant to be able to enjoy and run and play and walk with God in the cool of the day, and none of that's going on. And so, in fact, all that's going on is a lot of groaning. And so three groans and then a glory. The first groan is creation groans, beginning at verse 18 of Romans. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Real quick, just a couple of word studies here that I think are important. First of all, this word right here, for those of you who are bookkeepers and accountants, this is an accounting word. And what Paul here is doing is I've got this ledger I've got these two columns, and on this column is a present suffering. And then at the bottom, I sum it up. And then this column is a future glory. And I found this to be true. I've got a long common, a column of, of, of present suffering, and then I've got the glory of Christ over here, and I'll take the glory of Christ over that any day. It doesn't even compare to the to, the, to the, what I'm experiencing right now, this glory that will be mine. And by the way, that glory is when everything that, we, we, we heard it in the, in the catechism, when everything that is sad becomes untrue. That's a Tolkien, it's Tolkien, isn't it? Lord of the Flies? Or Lord of the Rings? Not Lord of the Flies. That's a different, that's a different book. <laughs> it's a good book too, by the way. Um, but everything that is sad becomes untrue. Everything that God had intended with creation becomes true again. And what we see in this world, everything that's broken, becomes untrue. Verse 19, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. This eager longing, literally it means leaning forward and looking ahead or standing on tiptoe. You, 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 nothing's coming, but you know it isn't. So you stand or you lean forward and you're trying to see. You're waiting for the parade, so you stick your head out in the street to see if the parade's coming. Because you want to, That's what creation is doing. With eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility. Subjected to futility, knowing we, we should be something and we're not that. We're something else. And so there's this futility, not willingly, 
but because of him who subjected it. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth. I was trying to, while I was preparing this message, I knew I was going to preach on Romans 8, and I was thinking, okay, I need to find a really great, a really great illustration of groaning. What's a great illustration of groaning? And then, silly me, I just read the Bible, and Paul, Paul supplies this really great thing. Now, I know I'm a dude, and I'm on thin ice talking about childbirth. But I do... <laughs> The one time my wife says amen. <laughs> I'm looking for a place to eat lunch today. <laughs> All right. I don't know anything about that, but I do know this. As a pastor, I spend a lot of time in hospitals. And I've walked down the hall of maternity ward, and I hear groans cries of pain. And then sometimes on the same day, I'll walk on the cancer ward and I'll hear the same audible noises of pain and crying, moaning, groaning. Same sounds, totally different vibe, right? Because the pain is something that a mother goes through and wants to go through. Why? Because of the prize, because of the promise, because of the gift of that child. That's how vital that is. The pain is moving towards a place. It's moving towards something. And so Paul is saying, much like the pain of childbirth, the creation is groaning in futility but there there is a purpose with the pain. And so Paul is using this for all the other groans as well. And it's so powerful and so beneficial for us that there is this this reality, this beauty of this. It's happening. But then it goes on, the second groan. Christians, we groan, verse 23. And not only the creation, but we ourselves. And what Paul, when he does this, we ourselves, he's talking to believers, to Christians. We ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. First fruits, Paul is just simply saying, there are many more believers that will come to Christ. You're just the first fruits. If you have a a fruit tree and it bears plums or cherries, well, you know that you just don't pluck them all at the same time, but there are a few that ripen quicker. And so you get those, you harvest those, knowing that that's a promise of more to come. And that's what Paul is saying of these believers. And by the way, I want you to think that. How many of you are the first Christians in your household, in your extended family? How many of you that way? Quite a few of you. This passage is for you. You are the first fruits in your household, in your lineage, in your legacy. You are the first fruits. By God's grace, there is more to come. But then he goes on. We groan inwardly. Our, 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 we grow inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons. Wait a minute! I thought we were already adopted as sons and daughters. I thought we were already we we're already there. And Paul seems to insinuate that it's not yet. And he's right. It's not yet because there is one more redemption that has to happen: the redemption of our bodies. Jesus rose from the dead physically, so will you, so will I. Every person in Christ, their body will be redeemed. There is a physical resurrection. And when that happens for us, then all of redemption is complete. And we walk with God in the cool of the day. We walk in the beauty of his creation. Not someplace else. Here, new heaven, new earth. The way it was meant to be. Pretty cool. And so there's this day, and I know that sometimes we as believers, we put more of an emphasis on our soul than on our bodies. We're we're parts. We're we're two parts. Immaterial, material. Body, soul. We are embodied souls, and we are ensouled bodies. There's two of us. Our souls have been redeemed by Christ, and one day, so will our bodies. He goes on, verse 24. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it patiently. That mother in the delivery room is in great agony and great pain. 
And no doubt she wants the pain to go away, but more importantly, she wants the baby. And if the pain, if the pain is necessary to have the baby, the pain is worth it. But now as that mother is holding that brand newborn baby, is the mother saying, I sure hope my baby arrives. No, she doesn't have to hope for it anymore because it's there. It's, it's arrived. And what Paul here is saying is, this, we wait for our redemption of bodies because this world is messed up. And we wait for that redemption. We wait for it patiently knowing that the best is yet to come in Christ. And he has secured for us that place, but we hope for it patiently. I rest in that when I groan getting out of a chair, when my knees are sore. I rest in that when I hear of a tropical storm, a tsunami, an earthquake. I rest in that when I hear about invasions by tyrants. I rest in that when I see crime. I rest in that, that, that I recognize that this is what we have made of this world, but this is not all there is. There is a banquet waiting for us. And that banquet is going to be beautiful. I hope you can see these pictures. Oh, yeah, good, all right. These three guys you've probably never heard of, uh, Nakadi Aydin, Ugar Yüksel, and Tilman Geshki. They were missionaries in Turkey. In 2007, um, uh, 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 Tilman was a German, is a German. These two guys were Turkish. Um, they, were, they developed a ministry of Bible printing. They would print Bibles and distribute those to villages, to towns throughout Turkey. And some young men, five young men, uh, communicated with them that they were interested in believing in Jesus, so they wanted to have a Bible study. And so these guys said, absolutely. So they made a rendezvous time in an apartment where they could be able to have the Bible study. These five young men came in in their 20s. They came in, they closed the door, locked the door, bound these guys, and with kitchen knives, tortured them for three hours. And they eventually murdered them. Now, Typically, we don't talk about those kinds of things. I think we should probably talk about them more than we do because that's a reality. This was in 2007, by the way. But the story I want to talk about is Tillman. This is his wife and children. This is Suzanne, his wife. And they were given permission to leave the country, to escape the country because they had heard that threats were coming upon her and the children as well by a lot of the townspeople that did not like the gospel of Christ. She chose to stay with her children. And you don't know why? She chose to stay, and here's a quote, because I want the people of Turkey to experience the goodness of Jesus. Goodness of Jesus? Her husband, who followed Jesus, was tortured for three hours and murdered. Goodness of Jesus? How in the world could she ever do that because of this groaning inwardly, this hope? This hope that I've got this accounting thing is that right here I've lost my husband. I'm grieving his loss. I am worried. I am fearful for my life and my children. I've got this. But then I put this against the glory that will be revealed to us. Doesn't even compare. I'll take Jesus. I'll take the glory any day. It's a wonderful and powerful story. So we groan as Christians. She groaned inwardly, but knowing that there will be a day when that glory will be revealed. The third groan, the spirit groans, verses 26 and 27. Likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. There is stuff going on at the depths of your soul and mine that we can't even verbalize. We don't even know. That's why we've got this one. He searches the hearts, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The Spirit that is in you, you have the Spirit. You need not ask for Him if you are a Christian. You have the Spirit in you. He is there. He resides in you. And this great God and Father, Jesus Christ, knows your heart better than you do. And he knows the groaning. And the Spirit intercedes on your behalf to the Father according to the will of God. You realize what's going on there? 
is that you and I have pain. We've got a pain of marriage. We have pain of wayward children. We've got a pain in our body. We've got a pain with our career. We have pain everywhere, and we groan all the time. And we find ways to medicate, to cover it up, to do whatever we can to avoid the groaning. As parents, we want to make sure our children don't groan, so we take all the groans from them. We take it upon ourselves. But the truth is, they groan as well. A whole lot of groaning going on. And we have this God that is engaged. He didn't just say, I pronounce you Jesus with pixie dust that you're saved. But rather, he indwells us and he groans with us in ways that we can't even understand. What an incredible gift that is. And so where is all of this leading? It's leading to quite possibly the most popular verse that's been embroidered more than any other verse on the planet. Verse 28 of Romans. And we know, we know, that for those who love God, how many things? All things work together for the good. For those who are called according to his purpose. This great God in the midst of our groaning, in the midst of a creation groaning, in the midst of us groaning, in the midst of, of the spirit groaning, all things, all things for those who love God work together for good. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. God's will for your life, God's will for your life is that you and I be conformed into the image of Jesus. That is his plan, and as we groan, the presence of sin is there. That addiction is still there. That secret sin that nobody knows about is still there. Or that sin that everybody knows about is still there. And God's plan in his power and his love, as he groans for us on our behalf, he is moving us and making us to be like his son. So that one day, we will be able to sit at the banquet and there will be many place sittings and many chairs, no rotten food, nothing burnt. It will be perfect. That is, that is how the Bible depicts glory, is just one humongous party. No cloud hopping, no harps as far as I know, maybe a banjo or two, an accordion. No offense, accordion players. Nothing but glory. I kind of want to wrap this up by talking about a man that had a huge impact on my life. This is my uncle, Bob, Bob Hiller. He was my mom's brother. And uh, I treasure every mem memory I have of this uncle. He, he, he lived in the Boise Valley where I lived, and he was a huge part of my life. Taught me how to be a man. Always had time for me. I was probably so precocious and and everything, but he, he never once had a crossword for me. He'd take me fishing. He taught me how to shoot, uh, many times how to hunt, and I had just a huge impact on my life. He, was, uh, he enlisted along with my father, en enlisted in World War II. This is from World War II. My father was stationed in China fighting against J Japan, and my uncle Bob was stationed in England on a bomber in the Air Force, 8th Air Force, um, and he would run bomb raids into France and Germany. He was a, a waste gunner and also the guy that was the one that dropped the bombs over the target. That was his job. He flew in 17 successful missions. 17, they, they called them milk runs. Um, but 17 successful missions. This was the crew. This is my uncle right here. Um, and it's just a, it, it's a great picture. On the 18th mission... They were, uh, they were so shot up, they, they were forced to crash land in Switzerland. And he and the crew got out just before the plane exploded. His legs were greatly injured, and so he crawled into a ditch, and like in five minutes, the Germans were on him, and he became a prisoner of war in Germany, and in Switzerland. If you were to tell, that the, tell my uncle that the Swiss, were, the, Switzerland, the, the Swiss were neutral, he probably would have slugged you. There was nothing neutral about them from his perspective. He and the crew, they became prisoners of war for eight months. He was a prisoner of war for eight months. On Christmas Eve, after the eighth month, he and two of these escaped. And for 12 days, 
they were being chased by German and Swiss troops, shot at, dogs were sent after them, and, uh, and they escaped. The French resistance helped them get back to England, and eventually he got back to the States and got back to uh, the Boise Valley and raised his family there, my cousins. That, that's his job, or that, that was what he did in the Air Force. The unique thing about him is that I didn't know any of the circumstances of his experience as a POW or the escape, even though he played an integral role in my life. In fact, one time, I was about eight or nine years old, I, I, I asked my mom, because I noticed that Bob had these slight tremors, very subtle. He had the shakes in both of his hands, which was weird because he was an excellent archer, excellent bow hunter. He could shoot really well, and he was a cabinet maker by trade. But he had these shakes. And I remember asking my mom, why does Bob have the shakes? And she, she just said, it's something that happened in the war, don't ask him. So I never did. I never asked him. Fast forward 45 years, and my son Scott is writing a report on World War II. And he, he knows about his grandpa, and he, know, he knew about Uncle Bob, and so he said, how about if we go to Boise, see the family, and I can interview Grandpa about the Flying Tigers in China, and I can interview Bob about the 8th Air Force in England. And so that sounds good. And so we did that, interviewed Grandpa, my dad, and then we went over to Bob's house. And on the way over to Bob's house, I told Scott, do not ask him about being a POW. Don't ask him. I'm just re repeating what my mom told me. And so he didn't. And so we're just sitting, he's, and Scott's asking very general questions about World War II and about Bob's role on the B-24 or whatever it was, and, and uh, just general questions. And all of a sudden, he just looks at Scott, and, and by this time, Bob's about 90. And he says, did you know, Scott, that I was a POW with the Germans? And Scott's, well, I'd heard about that, and, uh, but I think, Scott, would you like to talk about it? He says, oh, sure, no problem. And so he told about the escape, all the details. I mean, I'm just sitting there. I'm just, this guy has played a huge role in my life. I knew nothing about this, nothing, how they escaped. They had to jump off of a cliff at night not knowing where the bottom was. And so Scott is just writing and writing and writing and writing and writing and writing and, and just getting all these facts down about the experiences of POW. And I'm just taking it in. I'm just amazed at what happened. And so I got bold. I asked, Bob, I got to ask you, and you don't have to answer if you don't want to, why do your hands shake? And he looked at his hands, and by that time, they were really pronounced. They were very conspicuous. And he, he chuckled and said, oh, I think that happened when they sent the dogs after us. Because I know fear. I've been shot at. He was wounded a couple of times with flak from the enemy fire. He'd crash landed and barely made it out alive, hurting his legs that still bothered him for the rest of his life. But I said, the kind of fear that I experienced when they sent the dogs at us, we can hear them from about a mile away. And we were running in two feet of snow, and they were catching up. And the dogs were getting louder and louder because our scent was more fresh. And at that moment, something in me broke. And I think that's where I got the shakes. He made a home, raised his family, had a huge role in raising me. So when was he free from the POW camp? Well, he's free back on Christmas Eve when he escaped. He was free, even though he was running from the German soldiers and the Swiss soldiers for 12 days. Starvation, emaciated, barely made it out alive, makes it back. He was free from that prison camp, but then again, he wasn't. Because his legs bothered him until the day he died. He died at the age of 94. The shakes never went away, and so there probably wasn't a day that went by that Bob didn't think about those eight months and those 12 days. They had such a profound impact on him. The same is true for us. Every one of us in this room, we have faced some form of trauma. Others of us have faced incredible trauma, others not so, but we are affected by that and we groan 
We groan because we know that there is something out there for us, something that is beautiful, this wonderful thing, and all we can do is have a place setting for ourselves and rotten food. But we have this promise that the best is not life now, the best is yet to come, and that gives us hope. We hope for that. Because we do, we do live in a broken world. We have broken our relationship with God, and that broke the world. In Christ, God has fixed our relationship with him, and that will fix the world. Do you believe that? Christ is the only fixer of this world. Vlad Putin needs to hear that. Joe Biden needs to hear that. Craig Hardinger needs to hear that. So do you. The only one that can be able to truly present the banquet for us is the one who died on the cross on our behalf. Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so, yes, there is suffering. Oh, there is suffering. And on this, and you could list all of the things that you have suffered. You can list them very, very well. And on this side, glory. And what Paul is saying, this doesn't even compare to that. This is going to be incredible. This banquet and everything that is sad and untrue or true will become untrue. So the catechism is this. And I'd like you to just read this with me. If you'd stand, please, and we'll close with reading this question, the response, and then why it matters, all right? So we'll read. If you'll read with me every word, those of you at home, you can do this too, okay? Here we go. How has God fashioned the world? God created everything as good, but sin seeks to decreate what God has made good. So the world's present state depicts the serpent's chaos more than our creator's kindness. Why does it matter? The world as we know it today obscures God's goodness. In our anguish, we remember that one day God will make everything that is sad untrue. The goodness of God's creation will one day be obvious and unobscured by sin's influence. And we say that to the glory of God. May we be people where this is not just on a page somewhere, but it becomes our story. It is who we are, how we see the world. God be with you. I love you. Go in peace. Have a great week. Thanks for watching. Find out more about the Arcade Church community at arcadechurch.com.